In this episode, I interview Dr. Raj Mather about IVF. I'm Dr. Gail Busby, and this is I Forgot to Ask the Doctor. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to my podcast. In this episode, I'm going to interview Dr. Raj Mather about fertility and IVF. Raj is a reproductive medicine consultant and is also the chair of the British Fertility Society and therefore very well placed to educate us about fertility. I'm fortunate to have him as a colleague and I'm delighted to have him on the show. Raj, welcome. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be interviewed. Gail, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me and I'm delighted to be here. So Raj, it always really interests me to find out why accomplished colleagues like yourself choose particular areas of medicine in which to practice. So can you tell me, why did you choose to work in fertility? You know, it's that long ago, Gail, that it's not perfectly clear to me why I chose. But I've always found fertility really (laughs) interesting because, you know, I trained like yourself. I trained as an obstetrician and gynecologist. But fertility, you find, is a subject where you have more than one patient. And it's the only subject where you actually create a third life, as it were, or you, so you kind of have a third patient as well. Um, also, in fertility, yeah. you're bringing together medical treatments, so drugs and injections and so on, along with some surgical aspects. So it's a nice kind of overall um, uh, type of um, medicine or medical field uh, related to gynecology. And that's really what uh, attracted me to it. And I bet it's really, really rewarding as well. It's fantastic. It's fantastic, particularly when you see, I have to say, obviously fantastic when you see couples who've been successful, who, who have become parents, but also sometimes very rewarding uh, for couples who, who may not have succeeded in becoming parents, but have somehow benefited from the process of going through treatment. Wow, that's really, really interesting. So, Raj, as you know, this podcast is aimed at educating patients. And for that reason, we try to avoid medical terminology as far as possible so that it remains as accessible as possible to everyone. So let's start with the basics. Can you tell us under what circumstances couples have IVF? How long they should wait before seeking medical attention when they're trying for a baby? Are there other options first? So basically, can you tell us what can couples expect and when do you advise that that they go along for help? Sure. I think the important thing to say at the start is that the best way of making a baby is still the old fashioned way. Nothing can beat couples having intercourse at the right time. Um, And and that's what people should do. If they want to try for a baby, they should actually start trying for a baby, you know, in in the traditional manner. However, if conception has not occurred, if the woman hasn't conceived in a certain length of trying, then it's reasonable to see your doctor and maybe get a fertility specialist referral for further investigations. Now, how long should that period of time be? Well, it depends really quite a lot on the age of the woman. Where the woman is under, say, 35 years of age, where in general the chances of conceiving are pretty good, it's okay to try for a year before you see your doctor. And, and, and get a referral. But if you're 40 and above, then I think you should get a referral quite soon, perhaps after as little as six months uh, of, of trying. The other thing, of course, is that sometimes people have, they know about themselves that they've got conditions that might affect their fertility. For instance, some women may know they have endometriosis or fibroids, so they should get a, get a referral quite quickly, quite early. And the same applies to the guys, because if a man has had surgery on his testes, for instance, if he had undescended testes and needed operation as a baby, then I would get referred and tested uh, uh, as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. And can you tell us exactly what IVF is? What, What exactly does it comprise? Can you talk us through the process so that couples, again, who reach the threshold for requiring IVF, that they know what what they're they're getting into. Of course. So IVF really is a form of treatment in which the fertilization of the egg with the sperm occurs outside the body, so occurs in the laboratory. So typically, in in a natural 
pregnancy, in a naturally conceived pregnancy, the egg and sperm meet inside the woman in the fallopian tube. But in IVF, that happens in the laboratory in a, in a dish, uh, a glass dish. And to, in order to make this happen, we need to stimulate the ovaries of the woman with injections so that the ovaries produce a number of eggs. Now, as people listening to the podcast will know, in a normal natural menstrual cycle, the woman only produces one egg. And that's not really enough for a good success rate with IVF. So the first stage is for the woman to be able to inject herself and the clinic would teach the woman how to do this, inject herself with hormones that stimulate the ovaries and encourage them to develop a number of eggs uh, within the ovaries. Usually, injections are needed for something between 10 and 14 days. And at the end of this time, um, you have a procedure where the eggs are taken out from the ovaries. And usually, this requires an internal ultrasound scan. And with the scan, there is a needle that we pass into the ovaries and suck out the eggs there. Most of the time when this is done, the woman is given some sedation and pain relief so that she's not uncomfortable during the procedure. It takes about 20 or 30 minutes, but that it, it gives us the eggs that we need. And at the same time, the same day, we'll ask the male partner to produce a sperm sample. And that means that the lab then have the sperm and eggs to work with. And what the laboratory does is to combine the eggs and sperm there's slightly a couple of different ways in which they can do that, depending on whether there is a sperm problem or not. But the whole idea is for the eggs and sperm to be combined so that some eggs fertilize and develop into embryos. Now, those embryos are what we transfer or can transfer into the woman's uterus. And hopefully she will then conceive and carry the pregnancy and have a baby. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what I think. Okay, so um, so I'm just going to tease that out a little bit. So um, when the woman's injecting herself, is the number of eggs and the development, is that monitored? Or Very do you find that out, you know, when, when she ha comes to, to get the egg retrieval to remove them? Does she know? Do we know how many eggs we're expecting? We do. We do. That's a really good question. So we do. So one of the things that will happen prior to IVF starting is that the woman will have some ovarian reserve tests. So these are blood tests and ultrasound scans. And what this is doing, it's giving the um, clinic or the, the doctor an idea of her ovarian reserve, which roughly means how many eggs there are in the ovaries. And based on the ovarian reserve, a treatment plan will be developed, which includes the dose of injections, the dose of hormones that the woman will have to inject. Now, as I said, you know, the injections are done every day for something between 10 and 14 days usually. And from around day six or seven or eight, the clinic will begin to monitor you, which means you have ultrasound scans and blood tests to see how the ovaries are responding to the injections. Now, with the ultrasound scan, which is an internal scan, the scan can get really quite close to the ovaries. You can get really nice pictures of the ovary and we can see how many follicles are developing in each ovary. Now, follicle is like an area in the ovary which contains an egg in general. So we can count the number of follicles and measure the size of the follicles. And usually once a follicle reaches a, what we call a mature size, so something of like 15 millimeters or more, um, once it reaches a certain size, we think it's likely to give us an egg. Yeah. So before we do the egg collection, we can count the number of follicles. And we've got then got an idea in our, in our minds that, you know, as a rough ballpark, we should be getting that many, that number of eggs. So yes, um, and the monitoring does give us an idea. So what is, is there a concept of a good number of eggs where um, you have enough eggs, we're going to proceed, or conversely, is there a concept that, well, your egg response has been, has been not as good as we would have liked, so therefore we're going to abandon the cycle? Does, does that conversation sometimes need to happen? Indeed it does. Indeed it does. Um, and the reason for this is that the number of eggs that are collected is actually um, a predictor of the chance of success, which means that if there are very few eggs collected, say less than three eggs or less than four eggs, let's, let's say less than four eggs collected, then the chance of success with that treatment cycle becomes low. Because not all eggs that we collect will fertilize and then not all the eggs that fertilize will develop normally into embryos. 
And that means if you start with a smaller number of eggs, then you're less likely to have a good quality embryo to put back. So sometimes the ovarian response can be very poor. Sometimes, often we can predict that from the ovarian reserve tests that we did at the start of, of treatment. And if the response is very poor, then there has to be a serious conversation between the patient and, and her clinic, whether it's even worth going ahead with the egg collection procedure. After all, that is a surgical procedure. And if that's going to result in very few eggs, say zero or one or two eggs, then you really have to think about whether it's worth going ahead with that or whether you should stop and think of an alternative, maybe stimulate the ovaries with an even higher dose of injections or even an alternative like donor eggs. We also um, worry a little bit about getting too many eggs, but we can, we can discuss that because that can lead to a complication called hyperstimulation syndrome. Okay. And so, so, so most people who are going to have IVF per cycle, so ideally, the, certainly the, the doctor wants one baby, correct? Yeah. Um, so suppose you get 20 eggs, what happens to the others? Sure. So yes, we, we, like, we like singleton pregnancies, as we call them. We like one baby or one baby at a time. Um, the, 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 the reason for this preference is because although twins are absolutely delightful, but unfortunately, having a twin pregnancy increases the risk of complications, not just for the babies, but also for the mother. And these include some very serious complications like preterm birth and even um, the need for special care. And, and even a higher chance of the baby dying very, very young. And for this reason, we prefer to, for women to conceive a singleton uh, pregnancy. So, as you said, if there are a lot of eggs, you are likely to generate a, a number of embryos. We can transfer one, and now the technology is excellent because it allows us to freeze any remaining good quality embryos for your use in the future. So you haven't lost those embryos. Um, they can be used in the future, if the first cycle doesn't work, or even if it does work, you can use them in the future to have a sibling uh, for the baby you had with your uh, initial treatment. And that's really made IVF much more cost effective and safer because it mm -hmm. reduces the risk of twins. Okay, so, so one cycle of IVF can result in more than one baby, but not necessarily in the same cycle. Absolutely, mm -hmm. you can have more than one embryo transfer and that could result in more than one baby. Okay, perfect. And you um, briefly touched upon it, but um, what are the risks of IVF? Yes, so, so the risk I touched upon before was hyperstimulation syndrome called OHSS, and we try and warn our patients about this, particularly those women who've got a very high ovarian reserve or have polycystic ovaries. They're more prone to this, so we have to be extra careful with them. What happens in hyperstimulation is that the woman produces more eggs than we would like and the ovaries swell up, the tummy can swell up, they can be nausea, vomiting, the patient can become dehydrated. In the worst case scenario, there might even be the need for hospital admission and hospital procedures. So we try and avoid that and that is one way to avoid that is to use more modern stimulation techniques and a slightly lower dose uh, of um, hormones to stimulate the ovaries and also sometimes if the woman seems to be at very high risk of uh, hyperstimulation, we might advise her to freeze all her embryos, wait till everything has settled down, and then have what we call a frozen embryo transfer. So this practically doesn't completely, but more or less completely eliminates the risk of hyperstimulation and gives a very good chance of having a baby. Um, so hyperstimulation is probably the most important risk. There are some other risks um, that patients should be aware of. A lot of women feel different. They just feel emotionally different um, and slightly physically different when they're injecting, not necessarily in a bad way, but you've got to be prepared for that when you're injecting hormones. You've got to remember that it's going to be, quite often people have waited so long, and they've been through all sorts of difficulties getting NHS funding or paying for their own treatment, and you put a lot of expectation on the process. You've got to expect that it's going to be emotionally challenging. Um, for want of a better word. Um, so people have got to be ready for that. Um, the procedure that we do to take the eggs out involves a needle that is passed into the ovaries. 
So there is a small risk of that leading to bleeding or infection. In practice, we see that maybe one in a thousand cases, so it's not common at all. Um, well, yeah, I guess the, the biggest complication of treatment is that it doesn't work more often than it works. And we've got to be prepared for that sense of disappointment. Okay. And um, again, you bring me on to my next question. Um, how successful is it? What are the success rates? And are there any factors that influence success rates? So I always ask questions like this because there are some factors that um, maybe we cannot change. We're unable to change our age, for example. We're unable to change our genetic makeup, but we can maybe change how healthy we are, how healthily we eat, how much we exercise, our weight, things like that, various things. So is there any advice that you can give couples um, that maybe might improve their success rates yeah. of so IVF? I would say that on average, about one in four IVF cycles will result in a baby. That means that three out of four IVF cycles does not result in a baby. And it's a, it's a very cruel fact, but it, it is, it is, it is mm. a fact. Um, and the factor that is most important in the chance of success is the one you mentioned, its age, particularly age of the woman. We know that as the age of the woman increases, particularly as it crosses 35, the chance of success begins to drop. When the age crosses 40, the chance of success drops uh, a lot. Um, to the extent that if you're, say, 34 years of age, in most clinics, you would expect a chance of having a baby of something like 40%. But if you were more than 40, that chance has come down to 10% at best. And if you're in your mid-40s, if you're 43, 44, the likelihood of having a baby is less than 5%. So age of the woman is the, is the biggest single factor. Um, there are some other um, things as well that affect your chances of success. So we know that women who are from an African or, Af or African Caribbean background have a lower chance of success from the data that we've collected in the UK. We are not sure why that is, um, and, and more research needs to be done. Um, it could be because there is a higher level of fibroids, for instance, in, in these patients. Um, so sometimes patients will have certain very specific gynecological problems, such as fibroids, uh, particularly fibroids that are affecting the inside of the lining of the womb, where the baby would implant normally. So those can significantly reduce the chance of success, and they really should be treated before any IVF is carried out. Uh, some patients might have damage to their fallopian tubes, which results in the fallopian tube being filled with fluid and swollen. And this is called hydrosalpinx, and this can also reduce your chance of success quite a lot. And, and if you have a hydrosalpinx, normally it would be recommended that that is either disconnected from the uterus or removed before having uh, IVF treatment. So on the male side, there's, 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 there's probably a contribution of male age, just as there is a contribution of female age, but the effect isn't as, as severe as it is in, 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 in women. Um, we know that some lifestyle habits are really bad for conception in either the man or the woman, and the chief amongst those would be smoking. So cigarette smoking is awful for your chances of conceiving uh, with IVF. We also know that uh, women who are uh, obese have a lower chance of success, particularly if their BMI is over 35. Uh, BMI of up to 35, uh, if you're healthy in other respects, um, the chances of success are not affected uh, hugely. But over 35, it does make a difference. And also, it, it is associated with a higher chance of miscarrying the baby, uh, which is a particularly cruel thing to happen. Uh, if it happens in an IVF uh, pregnancy, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that it's you know people having IVF or considering IVF or looking at fertility in general uh, should really look at their lifestyle overall. Try and lead as healthy a life as possible. Um, make sure you're taking your folic acid, um, which is recommended for everybody who's con trying to conceive, and vitamin D because um, in the UK. We have no sunlight, <laughs> and most of the population that we deal with have some degree of deficiency of vitamin D, so people should be taking a supplement of that um, as well. Um, follow I would what I'd call a balanced diet, so 
there is no magic food that you can eat which will make you fertile and there's no no reverse magic food that you eat that will stop you from conceiving but eating a balanced diet particularly one that's rich in fresh um, fruit fresh vegetables and food that you cook yourself uh, is better for you than shop bought or ready made uh, food and confection and this applies to both men uh, and and women okay that's a really comprehensive answer thank you very much so you know you said at the start that um the best option would be to try the good old fashioned way to conceive and we have spoken now at length about IVF and the procedure is there anything between just so that people just enlighten people so if you yeah. have fertility issues is it straight to IVF or maybe is there something in between that is a bit more conservative that's a really that's a really uh, good question gail because quite often ivf is is a bridge too far for some, for some couples it's 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 quite medicalized yes. quite complicated and you know understandably not everybody wants to go straight to ivf there are also couples who might have a religious or a moral objection to ivf which which we do see occasionally so it de- does depend a little bit on what the couple's diagnosis is and what their test results etc show and that's why it's important to get specialist advice at an early stage one of the common causes of um subfertility um is where the woman doesn't ovulate on a regular basis so this may be quite commonly due to a condition polycystic ovary syndrome which you've covered in in a podcast before i know mm-hmm. so for those patients you know fantastic uh, options exist in you know with the use of tablets and injections to simply correct the ovulation problem and they have a very good chance of conceiving with that without needing ivf um similarly you sometimes have couples where the problem lies in a difficulty in having intercourse which might be for psychological or physical reasons and sometimes in that situation the clinic can provide you iui which is intrauterine insemination treatment where the man's sperm is prepared and injected into the uterus at the correct time just prior to ovulation occurring and that has a good chance of success if the couple haven't been able to have regular intercourse for for whatever uh, reason there are other conditions you know such as endometriosis which quite a lot of our patients have which can cause severe pain and so on and it's always worth discussing with your doctor your fertility specialist endometriosis specialist whether there is a role in your particular case for surgery for the endometriosis we know that medical drug treatment of endometriosis does not help with fertility but surgical treatment of endometriosis can boost your chances of conceiving and for some people it's worth trying that rather than going directly into the ivf side okay um and how long back to ivf now um how long does a treatment cycle actually last and how long because i can imagine patients who are undergoing a treatment cycle as you said it can be quite um mentally and psychologically demanding yeah. um they want to know as quickly as possible if it's if it's been successful yeah. um how long after um treatment do patients know whether this the, the cycle yeah. has been successful or not so as a as a rough guide um from starting the injections to stimulate the ovaries to doing a pregnancy test would be around 5 weeks so you need about 10 to 14 days of injections but then you have what's called a trigger injection which matures the eggs in the ovaries 36 hours after the mm-hmm. t- trigger you have a procedure to take the eggs out and say 5 days after that you have the embryo transfer so you're about 3 weeks in yeah and from the embryo transfer on the clinic will give you the exact date but it's anything between 11 and 14 days later that you do a pregnancy test so in total from starting the injections to doing the pregnancy test about 5 weeks and another 2 weeks before you have an early pregnancy scan because unfortunately sometimes you conceive but it's a miscarriage or even an ectopic pregnancy and the early pregnancy scan which will be two weeks after the pregnancy test is is the is the first uh, opportunity to diagnose those okay thank you so there are some uh couples who um may have um different circumstances than those we have covered so far 
um, and they may need other sorts of assisted reproductive technology. Can you talk to us a little bit about the use of donor eggs? You mentioned that before, and also the use of surrogacy. Of course, of course. So donor eggs um, is, is a type of IVF in which we take eggs from uh, a woman who, who does not intend to be the mother. Uh, or, or the parent of the child that will be conceived. Most often, donor eggs are used where the patient who wants to conceive has a very, very low number of eggs in her ovaries, or sometimes has been born without any eggs in her in her ovaries. There are conditions that women can be born with in which the ovaries simply haven't developed um, um, and, uh, during during their their life as a, as, a, as a fetus. Um, there are also some women who might have had to have ovaries removed for surgery uh, by surgery for cancer or or, or ovarian cysts or other problems, and and again uh, some women who uh, because of their age have a very low ovarian reserve and their own e eggs are not sufficient. So in this situation, the clinic will have recruited a donor um, who has to be under thirty six years of age by UK law. Um, she has to be screened for common genetic conditions and infectious diseases, uh, and she has to be counseled fully. And that donor is then recruited, and she undergoes the stimulation and egg collection and provides eggs. And those eggs can be used for treating um, another woman um, um, who, who approaches the clinic uh, for treatment. It's a very successful uh, form of IVF, um, but really it is used in a situation where the woman's own, own eggs would not give us a good success rate. Talking about surrogacy, surrogacy is where the pregnancy and the baby are carried by another woman who is not intending to be the legal parent or the legal or, or, or look after the baby. So she is carrying a baby for another individual or another couple. So there there might be situations where surrogacy is used because the patient who wants to have a baby has not got a uterus. He was either born without a uterus or due to some medical problem ended up with a hysterectomy and cannot carry um, a baby herself. And in this situation, the surrogate volunteers to carry a um, uh, baby. The surrogate is implanted with an embryo that will be developed from usually the sperm of the, uh, of the, of the partner of the woman who wants to be the parent and her eggs. Uh, and then surrogate has the baby and at the moment under UK law after the baby is born the couple who want to be parents have to apply to the court for a parental order and it's a slightly complicated legal process in the UK at this time but the government have promised to uh, make it simpler make it more patient friendly and we're hoping that next year the, the law will be changed great great and then you mentioned previously, touched again a little bit about egg freezing, which is another thing that um, I think people might, listeners might want to learn a little bit more about. What is egg freezing? In what circumstances is it used? How effective is it? So um, uh, egg freezing, uh, I'm sure you, 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 your listeners will be very interested because it's something that's really become more prominent in the last few years. Um, and the reason for this is that technically, it used to be very difficult to freeze eggs and have them survive. But with the development of a technique called vitrification, um, the, uh, the way the efficiency with which we can freeze eggs has increased a lot. So what egg freezing does is that it, you, we, we stimulate the ovaries of the woman just as it, it like is done in IVF treatment. So the woman injects herself with uh, hormone injections to get a number of follicles to develop in the ovaries. She undergoes a surgical procedure to take the eggs out. But instead of now fertilizing the eggs and making embryos, the eggs can be vitrified or frozen and kept for as long as you want, um, technically, uh, in the laboratory. The big benefit of this is if the woman is not able to conceive at that time and wants to have a baby in the future, then she doesn't, she's, she's got a little bit of an insurance policy about against the effects of her age. Because if you freeze eggs at, say, 29 or 30 years of age, but when you try for a baby at, say, 39 or 40 years of age, you can use those eggs 
And in effect, they're the eggs of a younger woman. So the success rate with those is much, much uh, better. Now, I have to say that the technique was developed initially to help patients who face this sort of problem because of a diagnosis of cancer. And because cancer treatment can damage your ovaries quite severely. So they were the biggest, most important group that, um, that are helped by the NHS uh, uh, um, with egg freezing. Uh, patients who are facing cancer chemotherapy or radiotherapy that would damage their ovaries uh, quite badly. But once we are confident that this is a viable treatment, it's been, it is available to a range of uh, people, including those who, who, who have no medical uh, problems. This is sometimes called social egg freezing or elective egg freezing. Um, and really, the purpose of this is to uh, provide a little bit of an insurance against the effects of age. But just to be clear, the chances of a successful pregnancy after egg freezing at an equivalent age is less than if you did it the old good old fashioned way. That it's, is, it's not a hundred percent insurance policy. Absolutely. And and it's a funny sort of insurance policy, let me put it this way, because firstly, if you mm. freeze eggs, but then you begin to try for a baby. 10 years later, you might conceive. So it's a type of insurance you may never need. You might conceive. And the other problem with it, as you said, is it, that a payout isn't guaranteed because you could use the eggs and still treatment may be unsuccessful. So it's yeah. something that you really have to discuss in detail with the, with the clinic, with the specialist, because they have to take into account your age and your ovarian reserve to try and predict what your chance is of success using frozen eggs in the future. So individualized care, very basically. Much, very much, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Individualized it's care okay. and, uh, and be careful of uh, um, uh, the cost that you're incurring and the risks you're incurring today for a benefit that you may never get in the future. Need. Yeah. Need or get, yeah. Uh, yeah. Need or get. Good advice. Okay, so thank you for those really clear and detailed answers to my questions. As you know, um, I ask listeners beforehand to submit their questions for me to ask on their behalf. May I ask you a few questions that, been, that have been submitted by our listeners? By all means, please. Perfect. I must stress at this point that it is very difficult to give specific and personalised advice to patients without a thorough knowledge of their past and current medical history, examination findings, and investigation results. Also, due to time constraints, I have summarized the questions in a way that I think retains the essence of what is being asked. Therefore, these answers should only be used as a guide and individualized care and medical management should be sought from one's own doctor. Okay, so our first question is from a patient who says, I'm pursuing IVF next year. I have stage four endometriosis and have had three recurrent miscarriages, which are currently being investigated by my wonderful endometriosis consultant, Dr. Eddie Osagi, who has been on my show. <laughs> I'm being re-referred again for IVF. My body mass index was too high and I was awaiting endometriosis surgery. I have managed to get my BMI down to 31, which as you said, is good news. Yeah with the aim to get to 30, and I'm not far now. My question is, with all this, what type of things do I need to consider with IVF, protocols, etc.? Although I'm being re-referred, I'm likely going to go private as the emotional damage of my infertility with my health hasn't helped. It's really sad uh, uh, because that is such a frequent and common situation that we are finding ourselves in because of the because of the pandemic and because of various problems with NHS funding, patients are having to pay for their treatment. And that only makes everything, yeah. magnifies everything and makes it worse. I would say to this patient that well done for bringing your BMI down to 31. And if you can get it to 30, that would be absolutely fantastic. Slight word of caution, lose the weight before IVF. But once you start the IVF process, try and keep it stable don't be actively dieting and actively losing weight during fertility treatment because that might harm your chance of success. So that's one thing. 
all the usual advice about diet and folic acid and vitamin D applies. Please take that. I'm glad you've been investigated for the recurrent miscarriages um, because if there is a factor that shows up in the tests, then that there might be some treatment that can reduce the risk of miscarriage and that can be put into place at the time of uh, IVF itself. Now, we used to think that women with IVF, with endometriosis should have a very a specific type of IVF treatment called the long protocol. Um, and we still do that, but, but the evidence or the research evidence that long protocol is better for women with endometriosis is it's not that strong now. So I think it's become a little bit less critical about what type of protocol you're offered. And if a clinic offers you long or short protocol, personally, I think both are supported by the evidence. But it is the sort of question that, 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 will, that will come up. Um, unfortunately, during IVF treatment, some women will experience an increase in their endometriosis symptoms, um, increased levels of pain. And almost always, this will settle. As um, when IVF finishes, the, the the symptoms go back to what they would have been, and the endometriosis hasn't expanded or progressed uh, as a result of, of the IVF treatment. Um, but again, something to be aware of so that you can prepare yourself for it. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Our next question, which you've kind of mentioned, you've talked about. I'd love to know more research about exercise during IVF. And this means during the medication, so actually during the cycle, during the medication, and also as after transfer. There seems to be very mixed views about the impact and why. This is true. I would love to have more information. Unfortunately, the research on this is, <laughs> is, is it, it isn't great. It isn't great. Um, so first off, um, couples, men and women, who do moderate exercise, so get out of breath a couple of times or three times a week regularly, moderate exercise for both the man and the woman is actually good for your fertility and good for IVF results. So that is pretty clear. So it is better to be doing some exercise as opposed to doing none. So no exercise, really bad. Okay. Um, and increased levels of exercise. There is some concern that very high levels of exercise during IVF treatment in women might be detrimental, particularly in those women who already have a normal body mass index. So I think it's difficult to make sense of all the slightly contradictory research that's coming out. But for women, I would say it's absolutely mm. fine to do moderate exercise two or three times a week for about, say, 30 minutes, but not do severe exercise. And certainly don't start a new unaccustomed exercise program during treatment. Don't start prepping for a marathon if you haven't, if you're not a regular runner, for instance, during IVF treatment. Um, but moderate exercise, regular exercise, strength or cardio is absolutely fine throughout IVF treatment and is absolutely fine in pregnancy. In fact, it gives you better results in pregnancy than doing no exercise. One slight exception would yeah, be absolutely. when you're reaching the stage of egg collection, particularly if the ovarian response is quite high and we are worried about hyperstimulation, it might be an idea to not do any kind of sudden twisting, turning movements at that time. Because what we're worried about is the ovaries twisting. And it's just a concern that we have. So if, you're, if you've been told about a, about a risk of hyperstimulation, maybe reduce exercise levels and be careful with what you do. Maybe do more stretching rather than uh, abrupt uh, movements uh, in that situation. Okay, perfect. So our next question, there's been a significant decrease in birth rates in many developed countries. What do you consider the reasons for this? Is it all the age at which women are conceiving or other modern factors? So decrease I, in birth rates. It's, 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 a, it's a complex uh, situation, but, but you're absolutely right. The number of babies born per woman in Western countries um, is, uh, has been declining. Um, that applies not just actually Western countries, but also to Japan and South Korea as they've transitioned and become rich countries. The, the birth rate has, has declined. In virtually every country in Europe, um, the birth rate is below replacement level. This is very marked in Southern European countries like Italy and Spain, uh, but it is true across, across the board. It's something to do with the way we live now. 
um, and and the pressures that 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 people face. Uh, it's true that um, women are trying for a baby at a later age than their mothers did, and that age has been increasing uh, um, every every decade. It, it's it's been going up uh, slowly but but surely. Um, I don't think we can. Certainly, I don't think we can blame women for this because it takes two people to have a to try for a baby, um, and and something has to be we have there's something has to be said about the attitude of men towards having babies in you know in in the equivalent uh, age group. Um, it may be that as a society we make it more difficult to have a baby and have a successful career, and we ought to be working mm -hmm. on you know making making it easier for women to have both. Um, at a sensible time uh, in their lives. There's bound to be a number of things, um, but yeah, as a society, we have to take note of this. So many, many social factors. Many. Okay, um, next question. So kind of similar. Um, what was the global picture on birth rates during the pandemic? I understand these dropped, but maybe it's different in different parts of the world. What are your views on the pandemic and birth rates, birth rates, sorry, including any perceived or real effects of COVID vaccines on conception? So I think the um, I think the initial feeling about the pandemic was that it would lead to a baby baby boom. Uh, I was always skeptical uh, about that, and um, and recently the data that have come out showed absolute reverse that there were fewer babies born. And if you think about it, although the pandemic, you know, people were stuck indoors, but it was heightened levels of stress, heightened levels of anxiety about their own health yeah. and, and about their financial futures and professional futures. So um, in some ways, people have voted and, and had a few babies and you can, you can understand that. A lot of subfertile people uh, who we treat had a terrible time during the pandemic because for a brief period, IVF treatment was suspended, not just in the UK, but across the world for different lengths of time. And patients who need other procedures before they can move on to IVF are still waiting for you know, surgery on the NHS to have their fibroids removed, etc., before they can have IVF. So all of those things, I, can, I think, explain why there has been a drop in, in the birth rate correlated uh, with the pandemic. I don't genuinely know at this stage whether there is data across the world, so we 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 don't really have a, a proper global uh, picture of that. Now, the COVID vaccine um, is a relatively straightforward thing because by now we've we've had literally hundreds of thousands of women who've had COVID vaccine attempting to conceive and COVID vaccine uh, during pregnancy. Uh, very importantly, um, we know that it doesn't stop you conceiving. Um, we know it doesn't mis make you miscarry. Um, the most, in fact, very recently, only a couple of weeks ago, there's a new study from Australia which showed that the rates of uh, problems like stillbirth were significantly lower in women who had received the vaccine compared to women who hadn't received the vaccine. So I think, although there was some, there was quite a lot of social media, I'd call it misinformation or um, uh, information based on some misreadings of the of the of the scientific literature. But thankfully, that 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 has been disproved, and and uh, there was no effect on fertility, both for women and and for men. There was a brilliant study from Texas where they did sperm tests on men before and after um, vaccination, and showed absolutely uh, no difference. No difference. I think that's really reassuring. Okay, the next question. My area has a policy that there's no funding for IVF. Therefore, they won't even discuss it with you. Just tell you to go private, which I did. But that has removed a lot of the ability to speak to anyone as they just shut the discussion down the minute I mentioned it, which is sad. Even if there's no funding, what are you entitled to in the way of tests, etc. on the NHS? And what are your rights once you're pregnant? I had to battle with the hospital here. They kept trying to send me back to my clinic abroad, said they didn't support IVF, that I couldn't have a baby in the UK. This was quite distressing, and eventually my GP managed to get the hospital to accept me. But is this normal? I don't that know about you, Gail, but I find this horrible. absolutely horrifying, don't you? This is, this is 
so not Honestly, right. Honestly, that sounds awful. It, it sounds absolutely, I, mm. I feel for this person. What an awful, awful situation to be in. Oh my God. But let, let me start with what happens if, if the, that part of the NHS doesn't fund IVF. I mean, firstly, they should. There is a NICE guideline and we're, the NHS is supposed to follow NICE guidance. Um, and I know most places are yeah. not following the full guidance, but by not offering any IVF, they're completely violating uh, the NICE guidelines. However, even if IVF is not being offered, they, the patient is still entitled to fertility tests and an opinion from someone. Because how do we know? She may not, or the couple might not even need IVF. But if they don't have the benefit of the initial exactly. NHS test, they'll never find out. This is, it's appalling, I have to say. I mean, I would encourage your listeners who are affected to, you know, join the Body Like Fertility Network UK, which is a patient organization that campaigns uh, for this, uh, for fertility fairness. Um, and really, this sort of thing, you know, we should jointly fight and, 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 and try and correct. Um, and of course, if someone has conceived, whether it's through IVF or naturally, and whether it's in this country or abroad, and they are entitled to NHS care, that is what they should get. I, it's, I find it horrifying that, that the NHS would refuse, would refuse care and, and tell them to go to the clinic abroad. That just does not seem right to me at all. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is not normal, I yeah, think is the normal. summary <laughs> of that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll also I'll also put a link to Fertility Network UK. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, at the bottom of the podcast, with me, so people can find it easily. Easily. Thank you for that. Okay, next question: What is Clomid? As I've seen it discussed in other topics, but not known if it could be an alternative to IVF. So Clomid, we spoke a little bit about this before. Yeah. So Clomid is a uh, wonderful drug. It's one of the oldest drugs that we have in gynecology and uh, it's been there for decades. And, and the reason it's been there is because it, it works a treat. And I'll tell you exactly for people, for whom it works. It, it works for people who don't ovulate. And it's brilliant for them because it makes them ovulate. Now, most of these patients have polycystic ovaries and it's brilliant for them because it makes them ovulate. It has very few side effects and it's easy to take and, and you know, it, it's safe to take. But it doesn't work for anyone who ovulates on their own. So unless you are, unless the fertility issue is lack of ovulation, it ain't going to help. So really, it's, it's brilliant if you don't ovulate. It doesn't help if you do. Okay, perfect. And obviously, it won't help if you've got blocked tubes, for example. All of that. Or if there's a sperm problem, for example. Exactly. It's, it's just for that one indication. Okay. So next question, what is the best diet exercise routine for optimum fertility? So we've spoken about that already. A little bit. I've read so many things. Saying... I was going to say that, that in, in terms of diet, the, as I said before, there is no one magic dietary ingredient, but there is research evidence that some, something approaching a Mediterranean dietary pattern um, is, is, is good for fertility, okay. both in, in, in men and in, and in women. Okay. Um, so I've read so many things saying don't exercise, avoid soy, avoid carbs, others saying you should have <laughs> these things, and I just don't know what's best. So you've answered that question. Yeah. Moderate exercise, and the healthy diet, diet yep. Yep. is all you can do and the best thing to do. And ideally that you've cooked yourself. Yep. I like that part of it. Because then you know what's in it. Exactly, exactly. And you know that you have, you've got fresh ingredients. Exactly. So a lot okay. of the shop-bought uh, food has things like trans fats in it. And again, I don't want to scare people, but trans fats appear to be bad for embryo development um, and, and bad for fertility. So simplest way to avoid trans fats is to not put them in your food and just cook at home. Yeah, okay. Next question. Why are some women on short protocols and others on long protocols? What's the determining factor? So we used to um, stress a lot about this. And, and one of the th things that's happened is over the years, people, clinicians come to realize that both short and long protocols 
um, tend to give you similar results, with a few exceptions, and I'll tell you what the exceptions are. If you've got a high ovarian reserve, uh, or polycystic ovaries, and you're therefore at a higher risk of getting hyperstimulation, then there's no question, short protocol is better. It is safer for you, it reduces the risk of hyperstimulation, and that's what really, in this day and age, clinics should be using for women with a high reserve. We used to think that if you have severe endometriosis, you should have the long protocol. But as I said earlier, um, the evidence on that is not considered that strong now, so it's okay to have the long protocol good success rates, it's also okay to have the short protocol. Um, one clear advantage to the short protocol is, is in the title. It is shorter, it takes less time, um, and it's therefore more patient-friendly, fewer injections and less monitoring, uh, monitoring involved. But really, uh, both are very well-established um, methods of doing IVF. Um, and I wouldn't feel shortchanged if I was offered one and not the other. Um this is a decision that's made by the the clinic, isn't it? It's it's not like you can pitch up and say, oh, can I have a short protocol, please? Is yes. that right? So, and secondly, for those who are naive to IVF, can you just explain what is meant briefly? I know it's technical, okay. but so people can kind of understand what we're talking about, yes. short protocol, long protocol. Is it the same drugs, but for a longer time? Oh. What's the difference? Of course. So the big difference in short protocol versus long protocol is in the length of time for which you need the injection. In a short protocol, the injections start roughly when your period starts. So at the start of the menstrual cycle, you start doing injections to stimulate the ovaries. Um, after about five days of injections, you add in a second injection, which stops the ovaries from releasing the eggs before we are ready to take them out. Okay, so that's when it starts, on the day your period starts, more or less, or, or within one to three days of that. In the long protocol, the injections have to start at least a week before your period starts, possibly even longer. Okay, so they're actually starting in the menstrual cycle prior to the cycle in which you're going to have treatment. And they're starting then because the long protocol is switching off your own cycle. It is switching off the pituitary gland hormones that drive the ovaries. So they're effectively switching all that off. Your own hormones are not active. You enter a state of temporary menopause. Sounds scary, but actually it's it's fine for, for most people and it, it's a perfectly valid way of, of, of treating, uh, treating patients. Um, it just takes longer. And yes, those menopause side effects can be unpleasant for some people. And for, the, for that reason, the short protocol is more patient friendly. Um, because it's quicker, more efficient, fewer injections, fewer side effects. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And next question. Why doesn't, well, this is the million dollar question, isn't it? Million pound question. Why doesn't it work if you have a viable embryo and conditions are optimal? It's, Do it's, we have an answer to that? We, we I, th I think we have theories. And I think most likely, in most cases, even when an embryo looks very good, looks brilliant on microscopic examination, you might be told it's a high-grade embryo or a, a good quality embryo, top quality embryo. Quite often, the embryo may not be genetically completely normal. And that happens in a very high proportion of embryos in in humans, in people. And embryos that carry mm. an abnormality may either not implant, so they may not result in a pregnancy, or if they result in a pregnancy, they may miscarry because nature screens out a genetically abnormal pregnancy. Now, because we don't genetically test all embryos for very good reasons, um, we don't know, but it's likely that quite a few of the embryos that look absolutely beautiful are actually carrying a genetic abnormality and that is why success doesn't occur. Um, could there be factors related to the uterus, the uterine lining? No one has ever proven that. You know, from time to time, people will talk about immunological factors and natural killer cells and so on. And that's been talked about for yes. decades, Gail, and people have done research and no one's ever actually proven that it makes any difference. So personally, and you know, along with a lot of other uh, professional bodies in, in, in the world, um, uh, we believe that uh, tests for immunology, natural killer cells, etc., don't actually predict anything, so we don't advise them. 
Okay. And I guess even out of the realms of IVF with, you know, people just trying to conceive naturally, you don't conceive every cycle anyway, mm. and we don't know we don't know why. It's just that this is, of course, mm. artificial, so therefore more investigated. But you know, women can try up to a year, like you said, um, without success, and then conceive exactly for reasons yeah. which are difficult to pinpoint. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have to be okay. humble about these things. We don't understand it all as scientists. We don't understand everything. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and our last question from listeners is what are the dangers of repeated cycles? You'll take a hit to your bank balance, definitely. Um, and <laughs> you'll have to be pretty strong emotionally and as a couple uh, to go through it. But that aside, um, there is the evidence is that it doesn't increase the risk of long-term problems, um, which I think is what the, the, the question is, is really about people want to know yeah. so so mm -hmm. things like uh, long-term risk of cancer is not affected um, by by having IVF um, as far as we can tell now take say uh, cancer of the ovary ovarian cancer ovarian cancer unfortunately is a very serious cancer it is more common in women who haven't had a baby so more common in infertile women now, those are also the women who will have IVF. So you can see immediately that when you try and do research, is it the lack of conception or is it the IVF? And overall, the balance of the research seems to be that your ovarian cancer risk is not greatly increased. Maybe in some subgroups uh, it might be, but overall there isn't an increase in the risk of ovarian and other cancers uh, with, with, with IVF. And I think it's also worth reassuring people that all the data we have about children born from IVF and their follow-up. Um, at the moment, it doesn't increase, uh, doesn't suggest um, properly an increased risk of um, long-term problems like in their development. Great. That's, that's really, really reassuring. Very reassuring. Okay. So, um, so that's, like I said, the last question from our listeners. Thank you for those um, answers. They were really, really helpful. I'm sure they'll be really appreciated. The last question is from me. So Raj, you have seen many, many fertility patients in your career so far. Given the opportunity, is there anything you would like to say to people who either think they may need assistance to have a baby or even are currently undergoing IVF? Okay, that's actually very easy. Empower yourself. Get well informed. Knowledge, knowledge really is power. So do your research, um, uh, read, read everything. I, I'm not one of those doctors who says don't go on the internet, but go on the internet, but use a critical open mind to look at what's out there. Talk to other patients, talk to your GP, talk to the professionals you trust. Um, so yeah, empower yourself by finding out as much as you can. Um, and then the second thing I'd say is to trust your clinicians. They, they are there to try and help you. Sometimes they will tell you things that, contradict what you may have read, but trust them. Uh, by and large, people in this business are doing their best to, 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 to help couples uh, conceive. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well said. Thank you. In closing, Raj, I'd like to thank you for coming on to the show and sharing your highly specialized knowledge with, with us today. Thank you so much for supporting my podcast. And above all, thank you so much for helping so many couples to have babies. It's a real, it was a real pleasure, Gail. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing this work. I think it's absolutely amazing what you're doing. And good luck with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Please keep your eyes and ears open for upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like and subscribe buttons to raise awareness of this podcast.